offering. Let's praise Him together. The spring of all my confidence, more than life to be. Whom have I on earth beside me? Whom may Christmas of my sophomore year in college. I hadn't gone back home for the entire semester. I was ready to get there. I just had the hardest final exams I'd ever had. It was December the 23rd, and my last professor kept us as long as he possibly could on the campus, and I went flying out of Waco, Texas, like a bat out of someplace other than heaven, ready to get home. And I was on a two-lane road in the middle of nowhere. There's a lot of those spots in Texas, by the way. Two-lane road in the middle of nowhere, my water pump went out and my car stopped dead. Miles and miles from civilization, no cell phones in those days. That was back when we had to walk to school uphill both ways, snowing all the time. And I had to sit there and wait for someone to stop and watch while cars passed me by. Mm. I will tell you, when somebody finally stopped, I learned what a precious thing it is to be in trouble and someone stopped to help. Jesus did not pass us by, not a single one of us, and he still stops every single time we cry out for his aid and his assistance. If I wasn't careful, I could get excited about that. <laughs> what a wonderful, wonderful thing. We get to hear him preach now and then, but we hardly ever have him lead us in prayer. I'm going to ask our own Brother Fred Luter to come up here and lead us in a word of prayer. But you have to promise not to preach, Brother Fred. Remember, this, <laughs> this is a prayer. Would you please lead us to God's throne of grace? Father, what a joy it is for us to be here once again in chapel, God. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And thank you, Lord, that you did not pass us by, God. We thank you, Lord, for this Our praise team, God. Thank you for this president. Thank you for the Falcon, the staff. Thank you for the speaker that's going to bless our hearts today, Dr. Mark Cross. God, thank you for all the guests who are here today, God. And we just pray your blessings upon our time together, that it may be fruitful and rewarding. We may be blessed by your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. You, Before you sit down, turn to somebody around you, shake a hand or two, and just just remind somebody near you, he stopped for you. Would you do that, please? Thank you so very much. Please have a seat. Thank you so very much. Before I introduce our speaker for the day, I have a little bit of uh, campus business that we need to do. Most often these Thursday chapels are the time when our whole seminary family gathers, and here's one of our seminary uh, professors uh, speak to us, but today we have a special guest. However, I do need to do a little bit of campus business. 
We got off to an interesting start, didn't we, NOBTS family, uh, this year with Gustav coming calling and Ike right on his heels, uh, coming by here and creating a very uh, difficult situation for just about all of us. I don't know anybody who breezed through September uh, here in New Orleans, and for some it created great hardship. Well, God has been interesting since then. I have learned it's a wonderful thing to pray that you live your life in God's hands and to say, okay, I'm trusting God completely. It's wonderful to pray that in theory, but boy, it's tough to live it out. As we had to experience watching the Industrial Canal, which is about six or seven blocks that direction, with all everybody in the nation and all the commentators wondering, and uh, our beloved friend, uh, uh, Brother uh, Geraldo Rivera, reminding everybody, it looks like this thing may go at any second. One barge during Hurricane Katrina broke loose from its moorings, and that one barge pierced the industrial canal on the east side. The barge itself crushed a whole block of homes when it finally came to rest, but it put up to 20 feet of water in one of the neighborhoods of New Orleans and just wiped it out completely, one barge. What we found out after the storm is that while all that was going on that uh, Geraldo did not know to comment on and make our anxiety even worse, 70 ships and barges were unfettered from their moorings and just floating around in that industrial canal. Seventy. And the hand of God held that levee firm. To quote an ancient Hebrew expression, wow, that's amazing. After the storm, we know some of our families had great economic hardships as a result of the storm. And I announced in chapel uh, one morning that we wanted to do what we could to help those families who had some economic hardships caused by the evacuation. At the time, we had $1,500 in our student aid, emergency student aid uh, fund. Uh, I didn't know where the money was going to come from because I thought it would be a little more than that. And by the end of that day, I'd received phone calls and messages totaling $25,000 of gifts coming to help our seminary family uh, with the storm. That was just, that was an amazing day. Well, the next day, we had a lawyer contact us with a notification that an estate was going to be settled, and sometime in the next few weeks we'd be receiving a check for a scholarship endowment fund for more than $1 million. And I said, boy, this is a pretty good day. Yeah. And then yesterday we were contacted by the New Orleans Police Department who said they'd been put under enormous pressure by FEMA. They had a real problem that they needed the New Orleans Police Department to solve, and that is they had thousands of meals all prepared, not meals ready to eat from the military, real food. They had thousands of meals and snack packs of goodies, you know, cookies and candy and treats like that that needed to be distributed this week, and they asked the NOPD police department to call and distribute all this food, and they called us and said, how would your seminary family like to have free food? <laughs> We're Baptists. I mean, I didn't, <laughs> didn't have to pray about that. And so at uh, 12.15 today, from 12.15 forward, after chapel forward, we're, we're all set up. We have pallets and pallets of, of meals for your families and snack packs for your families and your kids. And come with your car. It's going to be too big and awkward for you to carry very easily. It's set up so you can just drive through and pick up food for your family. And <laughs> wow, living in the hand of God is a very scary and intimidating thing. But boy, you get to see God do some neat stuff. And so I do want to invite every member of our seminary family, faculty, staff, and students to please come by Hardin Student Center. They've got it all set up now. They're working on it now while we're in chapel. They're all set up. Come by and pick up meals for your family, snack packs for your family, courtesy of the hand of God. And what a marvelous blessing this has been. I would say it has been a pretty remarkable September for some good reasons and not just some bad reasons. Now let's turn our attention to our speaker for the day. It's not an easy thing for me to say, but I will tell you that when the Southern Baptist Convention started in 1845, we started in a very deep hole on the wrong side of racial justice and love. 
We started for a number of reasons, but one among those reasons was an effort to defend the rights of slaveholders, which is not a battle any of us would want to choose today. It was a wrong stance, and we did not improve from that wrong stance. For many years, Southern Baptists were known, quite well known as a matter of fact, for their attitudes of racial prejudice towards people of other races, in particular African Americans. It is not a proud part of our heritage, but it is a very real part of our heritage. What I would love to do is to stand and say, however, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, we were different. I can't even say that because our African-American pastors in the city would not be accepted as students at New Orleans Baptist Seminary, and they had to start a little Bible school to train the African-American pastors, and our seminary said, we'll send some people over to teach, but you can't come on the campus and study. That's not a very proud chapter in our school's history either. What I am proud of is the... <laughs> indescribable patience of many African-American pastors and church people with Southern Baptist and with Baptist in general through those years. Because in spite of our wrong attitudes on that, they did let us be partners with them and all through the years of, of union, uh, seminary students and, uh, and seminary faculty would go over there and teach and work with them and we had a very cordial relationship in spite of a wrong racial attitude being at the point of its origin. Our seminary has changed its policies and race is no longer any factor at all in people's admittance into seminary. You need to be saved and you need to be called of God and that's what matters and that is as it should be. And finally, the Southern Baptist Convention passed a resolution, uh, uh, overwhelmingly uh, passed by the Southern Baptist Convention, confessing our sin of racism and repenting of our sin and saying we're going to do better in the future. And we're still on that journey. And I'm just very grateful and I'm very thankful. And students, you need to be thankful for uh, men such as these uh, pastors. We have meeting on our campus right now the uh, National African American Fellowship of Pastors here in the Southern Baptist Convention. It's a great joy to have them in our city and on our campus. And if you have a chance to meet any one of them, what you need to do is to shake their hand and to say, thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for all that you have had to endure and face in a world in which you've been a minority and not a well-treated minority. And please pray for me that I'll be better uh, in my years of ministry and fruitfulness. And it's just such an honor to have people like this. These are real spiritual heroes uh, who cling to Jesus and cling to the love of God when a lot of life's evidence doesn't tell them it matters very much and who have a chance to bear the brunt of wrong attitudes of Christians towards them. But they keep loving and they keep serving Jesus and they keep preaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. What a privilege it is to have these folks on our campus this day. And among them we, are, we have the president uh, who's going to be our chapel speaker for the day. And that is Dr. Mark Croston, born in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. He's been in Virginia for a number of years, pastoring a church in Suffolk, Virginia. Uh, he was educated at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and then at uh, Union uh, in Richmond, Virginia. He he has his DMN degree from Union, has had a wonderful, fruitful ministry for more than 20 years now uh, in Virginia, and it is quite an honor for us to have him as our preacher for this day. And I hope that as we enter into this time of continuing worship before God, and then we sit before the Word of God, that we will again just thank God for the patience of those who endure wrong, all in the name of Jesus. And we are reminded ourselves, when we get treated harshly by God's people, because it's going to happen to you, whatever the color of your skin. Just remember, uh, Moses was never elected to be the leader of the children of Israel. They chewed on him pretty hard. Remember whatever you face, that there are men such as these who have faced worse, and they've clung to Jesus. And they've believed in the power of his gospel and the power of his church. That's a sermon we've been seeing for a long time in Southern Baptist life and one we desperately needed. 
but we have the joy of hearing another sermon, a message from God's Word just for each of you as we turn our hearts towards worship. Stand and praise the one who's the only one worthy to cling to. You're the Word of God, the Father, from before the world began, and every star and every planet has been fashioned by Your hand. All creation holds together by the power of Your voice. Let the skies declare Your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author of creation. You're the God of every man. And Your cry of love brings us across. Didn't stay there, but you left the gates of angels. Go to seek and save the lost, and exchange the joy of heaven for the anguish of the cross. With the prayer you fed the hungry, with the word you calm the sea. Yet how silently you suffered. That the guilty may go free. You're the author of creation. You're the God of every man. And your cry of love brings out a cross. Victorious, wrestling victory from the grave, and ascended into heaven, leading captives in your way. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own. From the tribe and tongue and nation, you are leading sinners home. You're the author of you're the God of every man, and your cry of love brings out across the land. And you're the author. You're the author of creation. You're the God of every man, and your cry of love brings out across the land. Ground is firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When the trees are still and when striving cease, my comfort, my all in all, here in the love of
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock. Around this sinking sand, when he comes, and when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And of course, get on Christ the solid rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And holy Christ, we do praise you. That you are the only one worthy of standing on a solid ground. We thank you for becoming flesh, for dwelling among us. And we thank you for the gift that's found in the, the promise of the power of the cross in our lives. And this time we pray that everything Dr. Croston preaches would point to that truth. We thank you for this man of your word. We pray that he would proclaim it to us. And that as we leave Holy Spirit, you would apply it to our lives. That we would live the Christian life that you have called each and every one of us to. We thank you for your sovereignty, for your grace in this moment. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Certainly it's a beautiful day that God has given to us. We're excited about being able to be in his presence and yours on a day like today. I want to thank uh, your president, uh, Dr. Kelly, for the kind invitation to be able to come and to stand at this sacred desk and be able to proclaim uh, from the best book that has ever been written, the Word of God. Amen. I certainly commend it to you. And we're grateful to be able to be here uh, with the National African American Fellowship uh, for our uh, board meeting and for a special symposium on understanding the times. And I just need to make uh, just one little correction uh, in the introduction that was given to me, and that's that I am the immediate past president of the fellowship, and our current president is uh, Reverend Michael Ricardo Pig. Please stand, Mr. President. All right. I had to say that. I know I couldn't go back and face them if I didn't make that correction. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to uh, the book of Jeremiah, if you have uh, your Bible available with you on today. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 20, a familiar passage, picking up at verse number 7. Jeremiah, chapter 20, uh, picking up at verse number 7. And the word of the Lord reads like this. O oh Lord, you deceived me, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I want to talk in the moments that we have to share together on this morning from this thought. 
uh, how to hold on when you feel like giving up. How to hold on when you feel like giving up. Now, I'm going to give you a few instructions every now and then in the message as an African-American preacher. And so you're just supposed to follow some of my instructions. And so right now, touch your neighbor and tell them, hold on. Father, our God, we're grateful for this moment in time. We're grateful for the fact that you have brought us here by divine appointment. And God, we're grateful for the fact that we are now able to gather around the wonderful and inexhaustible riches of your holy word. Speak to us, O God afresh from its pages that we might be strengthened and encouraged and that your name might be glorified we pray it in jesus name and everyone who knows him said amen i'm now the most miserable man living if what i feel were equally distributed to the whole human family there would not be one cheerful face on earth To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better. You might be surprised to know that these words were originally penned by the 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Charles Spurgeon writes in his lectures to my students and says, fits of depression may come over most of us, usually cheerful as we may be. We must at intervals be cast down. The strong are not always vigorous, the wise not always ready, the brave not always courageous, the joyous not always happy. There may here and there be men of iron, but surely the rust frets even these. Have you ever felt like giving up? Have you ever just felt like you had it up to here and you couldn't take it any more? Have you ever had just one of those days that you wish you could just live over again? One of those times you wish you could recall and, and, uh, and just go, do it all another way? Uh, every one of us in our lives have those kind of moments when we've been beat down so bad, we feel so depressed, life has pressed us down, anxiety from every corner, that every one of us at times feel like giving up. And if you've never felt like giving up, I just want to say two things. One, keep living, and certainly you will. Number two, I like to say, maybe you're not trying, huh? And if you've never felt that way, you can probably go to lunch a little early and get in the head of the line. (laughs) Jeremiah had every reason to want to give up. He was questioned all the time plotted against, had death threats on his life. He was left in a dried up well to die. He was criticized at every turn, rejected often, thrown in prison, and his work set on fire. By the time we get here to the 20th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, he has had it up to here. Uh, with life, with his ministry, with everything that's going on in his life. And he is just ready, ready, ready uh, to give up. And I want to say that there are a few things we can learn from the prophet Jeremiah at this critical time in his life that we might be able to apply to our lives when we reach those moments in ministry when we just feel like giving up. Number one, and I want to uh, first ask an apology here uh, because I'm going to break a preaching rule at this particular moment and go to the end of the text and bring the end of the text to the beginning. And the reason I'm doing that is because it just works better for my sermon. So I'm just apologizing. So <laughs> some of y'all are going to talk about it later on. So I'm just telling you up in advance what I'm doing. So in the end of the text in verse number 14, uh, uh, first thing I want to say is you need to express your hurt and angers. Express your hurts and angers. Verse number 14. Cursed be the day that I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who bought my father the news, who made him glad, saying a child has been born to you a son. And so here's Jeremiah giving some ranting 
things about his own life. He said, my life has been so miserable up to this point uh, I, that I should never have been born, that it should not have been a glad day. And he's just hurt and angry. I want to say to you that uh, you need to allow some stuff to come out of you. Unexpressed hurt becomes anger. Unexpressed anger becomes bitterness and resentment. Unexpressed resentment becomes a destructive act, a psychosomatic symptom or depression. And, and the truth is that all of us have hurts and anger inside of our life. But the point is that you can't just leave it stuck down and bottled up inside of you. Part of our problems as Christians is we do not think uh, that it's often okay to express our hurts, angers, and resentment. And so we end up in depression like Jeremiah. Some of us this morning have painted on a smile like a clown paints on his face at the circus. But inside, we're really hurting and broken and miserable. And so I want to just encourage you today to let you know you don't have to keep all of that stuff on the inside, that it really is okay to express your anger. Remember Jesus? Jesus didn't take any tea for the fever. He went to church one day, the folk were acting up, and my Bible said he got ticked off mad. And he didn't just, he didn't just kind of go and say, well, I'm going to go in my prayer closet and see if I can get over this. Uh, you know, instead, Jesus the Bible says he took a whip, he kicked over some stuff, he probably uh, uh, whipped some folk and drove them out of the temple. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go to your local church and act like that way. You know, uh, Jesus can get away with that stuff, but we might not be able to. But the point is, he expressed what was going on on the inside. He let it out. And, and that's what we need to do in our own lives. The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. And so here in this particular passage, Jeremiah is just taking a moment to vent. Everybody needs to have somebody. Don't vent on the wrong person. But everybody needs to have somebody who understands what I'm going through, that I can tell all the issues of my life, all my struggles, all my hurts, all my pains, all my anxieties, and then I'm not going to hear it on the evening news because I told it to you. So express your anger. Touch your neighbor and tell them if you're angry, express it. Number two, uh, verse number seven, expect pain. Express your anger. Expect pain. He says in verse number seven, O Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Now, obviously, Jeremiah was a preacher, and obviously he spent some time in seminary. Because I believe that all of us believe that because we have uh, tried to be good Christians, and we have uh, accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and not just that, but we have responded to God's holy call to be his instruments and ambassadors in this world. We have given our life to the ministry, and I just want, I don't want to bust your bubble, but but I just want to give you a little warning. Everything is not going to end up all right all the time. You know, we just wish that we would be able to go in the churches and preach some wonderful sermons and everybody would just fall in line because they've heard from the Word of God and would just begin to live like godly people. And whenever we go out to share the message of the gospel with somebody, everybody would get saved and our baptism, baptism fool would just be uh, flopping over because so many people are in there all the time. Uh, it's, we just wish it worked that way. But the truth is, you go into real churches with real people who got real issues. I mean, the Bible calls it sin and all that kind of stuff, but I'm just saying issues. <laughs> and, and really, uh, it just it never works out that way. We wish to God that life would be a bed of roses, that everything, every day would be sunny, and that every vote would go your way. But it really doesn't work that way. You're getting a little taste of that right now. Because every class isn't easy. Every test grade is not an A. Somebody say amen. And so you ought to just, you ought to just live life expecting pain in your life. 
This flies in the face of the TV preachers who say you ought to be able to name it and claim it, get it and grab it. If somebody's sick, it's your fault because you didn't have enough faith. No, this is what the Bible talks about when it talks about real life. See, perfectionism is one of the causes of depression. Living life with the expectation that everything is going to be perfect is what sends people off the deep end. The truth is, life is not perfect. Huh? We are not perfect. Your life is not perfect. Your job is not perfect. When you get married, or if you're married, your mate is not perfect. Your marriage is not perfect. Your children will not be perfect. Your parents are not perfect. Our homes are not perfect. Our cars are not perfect. You don't have to uh, look far to know our finances sure aren't perfect. Our health is not perfect. Our friends are not perfect. And there's nothing in life that's perfect. Just in case the person sitting next to you didn't get that, touch them right now and say, you are not perfect. <laughs> See, when, when you go to a black church, always sit next to somebody you don't like because the preacher going to give you a chance to tell them off somewhere. <laughs> Life is full of trouble, of grief, and of pain. My Bible says, in this life you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Uh, and so Jesus understands that we will have trouble. Think about Jesus. All he ever did was good, right? All he ever did was love people who wanted to be loved and heal people who needed to be healed and help people who needed to be helped. And they crucified him. And so instead of, instead of expecting that life ought to be perfect and that everything ought to fall in line, you ought to just come every day fortified with prayer, fortified with God's power in your life, expecting something to go wrong somewhere. And if by chance you get to the end of the day and everything went okay, just lift your hands and say, praise the Lord. Third, excogitate positive things. Verse number eight. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord, he says, has brought me insult and reproach all day long. Now, Jeremiah is taking a very negative view of things in this particular verse. And I want to just kind of turn Jeremiah's thoughts and say, look, instead of looking at the negative side, you've got to look at the sunny side. And so I'm going to encourage you to excogitate a positive future. Now, it's not that I've come to the seminary today and trying to sound scholarly. I just needed another E word. <laughs> I would just, <laughs> I just want you to know a good thesaurus will take you a long way in the ministry. <laughs> Excogitate. You can kind of, you can kind of, uh, uh, E-X. C-O-G-I-T-A-T-E, -E, excogitate. You can almost get the meaning of the word by thinking about what you hear, right? X means out. Cog has to do with the mind, cognition. And it ain't means something's happening, like ear it ain't or edge it ain't. Hmm? And so the meaning of the word says, out of your thinking, let something positive come. So it says, don't just be thinking on stuff to your own detriment. Don't think about stuff to go nowhere. But as you're thinking about life, thinking about the challenges that are before you, it says, let something positive come out of your thinking. Don't waste that time. It's kind of a positive future. And so whenever there's trouble, whenever there's adversity, uh, you've got to put your mind on and begin to think about and excogitate a positive future for yourself. Let me see if I can get a witness to 
help me here illustrate this idea. There was in the Bible a woman who had an issue of blood. You remember her. She had been on the sick and shut-in list for 12 years. She had spent all of her retirement on doctors. She had uh, gone to every doctor there was in town. She had reached the cap of her medical uh, payments. And, and finally, after 12 years, depressed and discouraged, she heard that Jesus was coming by in town. And so she said, uh, she escogitated a positive future for herself. She said, if I can just touch his clothes, I know I will be made well. And so you know what she did? She started acting on that that she thought about. And the scripture says she pressed her way through the crowd. She gave an elbow here and a shove over there until finally she was able to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. And the Bible says that power came out of him into her and she was healed at that very moment. She excogitated a positive future for her life. Let me see if somebody else can help us. There was a man, we call him the prodigal son, remember? He went and asked his daddy who was rich for his share of the encouragement. Let me just stop right here and say, you know his daddy had to be mighty rich if he could just write off a check for his share of the inheritance. Anyway, the boy took the inheritance and went to town, spent all of it in riotous just living and at the end of a period of time ended up without a penny to his name. In fact, the scripture says when we find him next, he is sitting in the pig pen eating the pigs, eating the slop along with the pigs. But the Bible says that when he got into the pig pen, he has cogitated a positive future for his life. It says while he was down in the pig pen, he came to his senses and said, what in the world am I doing here? If I just go back to my my father's house, my father has more than enough in his house. And so you know what he did after he thought about something positive? The scripture says, so he got up out of the pig pen and walked toward his father's house. And a long way off, his father saw him as he was coming and said, there's my boy. Get the fatty calf. Get him a new robe. My son who was dead is now alive. And so whatever the struggle is, whatever the problem is that faces you, you got to excogitate a positive future for your life. Don't sit on the pew of do nothing. Don't just get uh, sullen and complacent where you are. God gave you a great mind so you can think about a great future for your life. No wonder Proverbs 23 and 7 says, For as a man thinketh, so is he. No matter, no wonder Paul told us finally, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is admirable, if there be anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Get your mind right. I have, uh, I have, I have seven points, but this is chapel, so. <laughs> Fourth, uh, exalt the word. Exalt the word in your life. Verse number nine. He says, see, Jeremiah, by this time, he is ready to give up. He is ready to call it quits, to Throw in the towel, take the pink slip, change seminaries, leave the ministry, go into another career. He is ready to get a divorce, abandon his family, commit suicide. Whatever people do on the days that they decide they're going to commit, he is ready to do it on this day. But then he, something happens. Something happens in his life. The idea of exalting the word of God in your life. See, uh, some of you all have been in the church for a long time. And, and I'm a great advocate of Bible memorization, putting some of the word of God in your life. Why? Because there are going to be times when you need it. There are going to be some times when you are confronted by life and you don't have Dr. Kelly to ask a question to or you don't have your seminary professor to, to
to explain something or the seminary chaplain uh, to give you some encouragement and some insight. There are going to be some times when it's just you and the trouble that's in your life. But the Bible says that Jesus is a very present help in the time of trouble. And so if nobody else is around that can encourage you, you need the word of God in your life so the Holy Spirit can talk to you in those moments. You see, the Holy Spirit will bring the word of God back to your remembrance so you can do something with it. And if you don't put it inside, and all of it does is stays on the page when you get in the time of trouble and you don't know what scripture to turn to, you don't have a Bible available, it's like putting a muzzle on the mouth of the Holy Spirit. But if you will put the word of God in your life, then God's spirit will speak to you in your time of trouble. That's what happens here in the text. Uh, it's because he has spent time in Sunday school, because he has spent time in his youth program, that the word of God had been implanted in his life. And he says in verse number nine, but if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, this is what happened. His word was in my heart. He said there was too much word on the inside of me for me to stay where I was. Not word in the page, but word deep down on the inside of my heart. Friend, I want you to know when the trouble comes and when you don't know which way to turn, you've got to have some word on the deep, on the inside of your heart. He said there was too much word in me for me to stay there. Friend, that's why I remember and that's why I call on sometimes when I need direction. Psalm number one, it said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in this law does he meditate day and night he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in this season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away therefore the ungodly will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish that's why when I don't know where my resources are coming from, I remember Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift up the ancient doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye ancient doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And when I'm afraid, I can call on Psalm 27 that says, uh, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked and even my enemies came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell, even though a host should rise up against me. In this I will be confident. Am I right about it? Or when I come to worship Psalm 100, make a joyful noise in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is He that has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving. Come into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And His mercy endures to all generations. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I'm not going to quit. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts through these words. Remind us of the encouragement that comes from your holy word. So that when we are confronted with trouble, trial, depression, 
Your word might be on the inside of us. Not just the daily news. Not just the daily gossip. But God, we need your word inside of us. It is like a fire shut up in our bones. God, we pray your encouragement and your strength as we leave this place knowing we never leave your wonderful presence. And we're grateful because of it. In Jesus' name. And everybody who knows him said, Amen. Amen.